This is KGW News at Noon. Thanks for joining us here at noon. I'm Christine Pitawanich. We begin in Salem where police are investigating a shooting at Wallace Marine Park, which left one person dead and another injured. Around 3 a.m., officers say they found a man dead in the north area of the park with a gunshot wound. Another man was also shot and taken to the hospital for non-life-threatening injuries. The park remains closed and officials say people living nearby should avoid the area. No arrests have been made. Back in Portland, police say they have arrested a person suspected in a stabbing this morning on Southeast 122nd. Two people were taken to the hospital for stab wounds. One of them had what investigators say were extremely serious injuries. That investigation is ongoing. And Portland police are also investigating another stabbing that happened just before 10 o'clock last night at the corner of Southeast Grand and Washington. A man was stabbed and taken to the hospital. He's expected to survive. Investigators say whoever did it took off before police arrived. No arrests have yet been made. And those are some of your local headlines. New at noon, a change in leadership in the Oregon Senate. Senator Tim Canope, who represents Bend, is stepping down as a Senate Republican leader. Starting April 15th, Senator Daniel Bonham, representing the Dalles, will step up and take the lead. Canope completed his third term in the Oregon Senate. Both Canope and leader-elect Bonham were among the 10 GOP members who racked up 10 days of unexcused absences while boycotting the legislature last year. They were disqualified from re-election under voter-approved Measure 113. In a statement, Bonham said if it weren't for that ballot measure, Senate Republicans would not have made the leadership change. Bonham was elected to the legislature last year and can remain in office until January of 2027. Multnomah County says it will pay for a group of 80 asylum seekers to stay in their Northeast Portland hotel until the end of the month. The group was facing the possibility of living on the streets as early as tomorrow after money from a nonprofit that was supposed to keep a roof over their heads ran out. County Chair Jessica Vega Peterson has called on city and state leaders to help out. KGW has reached out to the governor's office multiple times over the past couple days to try to get a sense of how the state can help. We have not yet heard back, but we'll keep you posted when we do. Okay, let's quickly check in with Rod for a look at our weather. Rod, what are we expecting for the rest of the day? Not much change from what we have right now. That means it's going to stay cool with highs strut literally fighting or struggling just to get up into the 50s this afternoon. Radar, we talked about this on sunrise. Not a lot of rain along the coast. We've got a little bit down Newport. It's been dry up in Astoria. And most of the rain in the valley right now is near I-5, but off to the east. And then you've got light snow falling up into the Cascades. It is rain at this hour through the gorge, but snow levels continue to be low, as low as around 2,000 feet. Some live cameras where we've seen some rain. Yaquina Bay live in Newport, 49 degrees. And remember, our future cast model has been showing maybe the best bet for completely dry weather is up along the north coast. So here's partly cloudy skies looking out from the Astoria column over the Astoria Meckler Bridge. So future cast looking pretty good. 51 degrees dry weather there. This is fresh snow on the ground over in central Oregon where winter weather advisories continue. This is the view from Aspen Lakes Golf Course. You can just see the base of the three sisters right there. Portland 47 trying to get up to at least 50 and maybe dreaming a little too much to leave the high at 53. Coming up, we'll talk about how long this cool weather pattern stays with us. I will tell you next week at some point it gets really warm again. That's ahead of my seven day. Yeah, that sounds good. OK, thank you, Rod. Oregon Congressman Earl Blumenauer wants to close a federal loophole that allows a billion packages to enter the U.S. each year without being inspected. John Adams explains how that could be contributing to our fentanyl crisis. A little-known United States trade provision called the de minimis loophole has quickly become a focus of legislators, business leaders, and law enforcement. The provision was put in place in 1930 but has been exploited in recent years to flood U.S. markets with cheap goods and to ship fentanyl into the country. That's because de minimis allows packages valued at less than $800 to pass into the country uninspected. It was a good idea in the 30s. It's a terrible idea today. Congressman Earl Blumenauer is leading a bipartisan effort to close the loophole and says it's necessary to slow the spread of fentanyl. Right now the fentanyl 
uh, situation is being delivered directly to people's homes, uninspected, untaxed. Uh, it couldn't be easier for them to be engaged in drug dealing. Jackie Thomas lost her 22-year-old son Jake in 2020 to a fentanyl overdose. Fell in depression and anxiety and went down from there. Thomas says her son attempted to self-medicate to deal with severe anxiety and ended up taking a pill laced with fentanyl. She has this message for lawmakers debating on closing the loophole. Do it now. What are we waiting for? For another 100,000 to die every year because of this stuff? No, let's do it now. Business leaders also say the loophole needs to close to protect U.S. workers. They say China is responsible for sending a majority of these unchecked packages into the country. Many contain cheap or counterfeit items made with slave labor. When companies in other countries engage in unfair trade practices, or take advantage of loopholes in our trade policies, our workers feel it. We can make a difference in terms of fighting fentanyl, in terms of fairness for our business. It's an important signal, and being able to stand up to China and get rid of two-thirds of this traffic, I think is a very important development. That was John Adams reporting. Blumenauer says a bill to close the loophole passed the House in 2020, but was held up in the Senate. He believes the proposal now has enough bipartisan and public support to move forward. Oregon Governor Tina Kotek has signed into law Oregon's first major campaign finance reform legislation in decades. House Bill 4024 passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. Government watchdog groups and labor unions also supported the bill. It puts stricter limits on how much so-called small donor committees can donate to candidates. It also slashes the maximum amounts that nonprofit membership organizations are allowed to give candidates. But it doesn't kick in until 2027, after the next gubernatorial and statewide elections. Also, Governor Kotek answering, addressing rather the possibility of creating an office for her spouse. This after three of the governor's aides recently left. Kotek says those resignations had nothing to do with the first spouse, Amy Kotek Wilson, and called them personnel decisions, though she didn't clarify further. The governor says her wife, who has a master's in social work and is in recovery, can help Oregon battle one of its largest issues, addiction. And while Kotek acknowledged there was some uncertainty around exactly what kind of role a spouse might take, she says she'll still be the one making decisions. But at the end of the day, I make all the policy decisions. I was elected, I'm the governor, the buck stops with me. She says that position would be unpaid. The governor says tomorrow her office is planning to ask the Oregon Ethics Commission questions on what role her wife can have in her administration.